So we've been talking about proportions and confidence intervals in regards to proportions, and now we're gonna switch gears. And we're gonna do everything all over again, but with means. Aren't you excited? Yes. Yeah, let's go! Oh, by the way, there's gonna be a huge twist in the middle. Here we go. Actually, in the next five minutes. All right. What was the formula for constructing a confidence interval for population proportion? You all know this. P hat plus or minus the Z star critical value times the square root of P hat times one minus P hat divided by N. This is the formula that wakes you up at three o'clock in the morning and you're like, no! All right, maybe not, but it's fine. All right, in more general terms, this is the point estimate. P hat is the point estimate, right? This whole thing on the right side of the plus minus is the margin of error. So but in the smaller parts, it is the critical value, the Z star critical value. And then this is the standard error. Do you guys remember why that's called the standard error and no longer called the standard deviation? Because we're using P hat, which is a sample proportion, not P, which is the population proportion. If that was really P, then that would be called the standard deviation. Because we are estimating P using P hat, then we have, we're calling it the standard error. All right, back to means, okay? So remember that X bar estimates mu, right? Sure, whatever you say, lady. S sub X estimates sigma, right? Okay. On your formula chart, this is sampling distributions for means. We've seen these two formulas right here before. The mean of x bar is just mu from the problem, and the standard deviation of x bar is just sigma over the square root of n. We get sigma from the problem. But in our new world that we live in, in chapter eight, we are no longer going to be given mu and we are no longer going to be given sigma. So what should we do? We're going to use x bar to estimate mu. We're going to use s sub x to estimate sigma. Hence, why you see on the right where it says the standard error is... Now, this, the formula chart just says s. S and s sub x, it's the same thing. Okay, it's, it's whatever. So that's S sub X. There's your sample standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. And so again, instead of using the population data, we're gonna use from a sample and we're gonna use uh, the estimations in our formula, okay? So here is the formula for a confidence interval for a population mean. X bar is our point estimate, plus or minus, T star times S sub X over the square root of N. This is the same format as the proportion one. Point estimate plus or minus, this whole thing is called the margin of error. This is the point estimate, this is the critical value. It's a T star critical value. And this is called the standard error. It is the standard deviation formula, but I'm using S sub X instead of sigma in my formula. All right, what questions do you guys have for me? You should have a really big question right now. What the heck is this T star crap? All right, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the deal, you guys. Here's the deal. We have a little problem here. Z star is a normal distribution that can be used when we're just estimating one parameter with a statistic. What? What for are you saying? Up top, uh, I'm going to rewrite it since it's not on my screen. But up top, this was your formula um, right here, right? In this formula, in this entire formula, we only have one parameter that is being substituted in with a statistic. Instead of using P, we're using P hat. That's one parameter that is being estimated. In this formula, we have two. 
mu is being estimated with x bar, and sigma is being estimated with s sub x. There are two levels of variability. That means that my normal distribution isn't quite as normal as a z-score distribution. So, because we have more variability, we're going to use something called the t-distribution. Here's the good news. The t-distribution works and acts very similarly to the z-distribution, but here is the t-distribution. It's on the top here. Notice the difference. The z distribution's on the bottom, the t distribution's on the top. What is the difference? I found this on the web. I, I wasn't talking. Well, I was actually kind of concerned. All right. Uh, well, I'm sorry. What did you say the difference is? There's more variability. Why do you guys think there's more variability in the t distribution? Because I'm estimating two different parameters, not just one. Notice this Z distribution. If I did know sigma, I could use a Z distribution. But I have to use the T distribution when I don't know the population standard deviation because that gives me two variables. Okay, so the T distribution has a slightly different shape than the standard normal curve. The T distribution has more variability and is more spread out in the tails. So if you look, this is what I'm basically talking about. You can see here, our T distribution goes way further out in the tails, okay? It is still unimodal. It is still symmetric. It still centers around zero. It's still going to have standard deviations that we're going to be using in our, as our critical values. All of that stuff's going to be the same. The difference is, is that we have two levels of variability, okay? So again, our two variables, we have x bar and s sub x. So we have two variables estimating the true values. All right. On the bottom there, you'll see sigma. If we know sigma, we can use Z. But let me give you guys a little hint. You're not going to know sigma. You're just not. Because in the formula for standard deviation, I have to know the mean. Part of the formula for standard deviation is to take every value and subtract the mean. If I don't know the true mean, I can't get the standard deviation and vice versa. Okay, so if you don't know mu, which we don't, we're not going to know sigma. So the reason that we're using this new t distribution is because we don't know sigma. We don't know the standard deviation of the population. Okay? So if we did, we could use z, but we're not going to. Cool? Cool. So we're going to use a t distribution. Everything's going to work the same, except it's going to be called t instead of z. Cool? Also, there's new places in our calculator we're going to have to go. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's do it. The T distribution also has these fun things called degrees of freedom. Have you all ever heard of degrees of freedom? Oh, it's like chi-squared. Some of you know about chi-squared. By the way, chi-squared is chapter 11 in our class. We will do chi-squared the correct way in our class. Yeah, it's chapter 11 for us. All right, so degrees of freedom. 
basically, degrees of freedom are, um, it's a way to describe what T distribution you're going to be on because there are an infinite amount of T distributions. Yay! All right. T distributions, degrees of freedom. You can find a T distribution, degrees of freedom. DF equals N minus 1. Your degrees of freedom is N minus 1. N is what? What is N? Uh, That's your sample size. size. Minus 1. So um, we write the T distribution with whatever degrees of freedom this way. It looks like this. So T and then N whatever the N minus 1 is, is is as like a subscript, okay? So here's an example. Let's say n equals 38. Then that means we would have a t distribution with 37 degrees of freedom. Let's say we have a sample size of 500. What would be our t distribution? It would be a t 499, okay? What is a degree of freedom? Here's the easiest way I can explain it. Let's say I have 30 students and I have 30 desks. Are you with me so far? 30 students are lined up at the door to come in and there are 30 desks. The first student, how many options do they have to sit? 30. 30. They go sit. The next student, how many options do they have to sit? 29. And the next student? 28. And the next? And so on and so forth. The last student... The last student, how many options do they have? One. They got one choice. Therefore, do they really have a choice? No. Do they really have freedom to choose? No. no. That's sort of what degree of freedom is, okay? When I have 38 people in a population, 37 have a little bit of wiggle room or variability. The last one has no freedom. So there's 37 people that have freedom, 30, the other 38 persons just stuck. That's basically how I think of degrees of freedom, okay? All right, cool. T star critical values. T star critical values are exactly the same as Z star critical values, meaning they tell us how many standard deviations we're going to be going out in order to capture that middle percent. Now, I have bad news for you. They do not stay the same every time because it depends on your degrees of freedom, okay? So, we're gonna figure out how to find T star critical values. What critical value of T star should be used when constructing a confidence interval for each of the following settings? We need a 95% confidence interval based on a SRS of size N equals 12. Now, the way we did this with a Z star, we did this, uh, and we're gonna do it similarly. We basically said, okay, we are capturing 95% in the middle. And so what is the area in one tail? 0.025. All right, so we got 2.5% in each of these tails here, right? 2.5% in each of these tails. All right, cool. And we said, all right, the bottom is going to be the negative T star. The top is going to be the positive Z star. And we did inverse norm, right? We can't use inverse norm because of the fact we're not on a normal Z distribution. But if you will, please go to second VARS. Living right below inverse norm, there is inverse T. Now, inverse T, you need an area. Well, guess what? It works the same as it did with inverse norm. Your area is 0.025. Or what other area could you use? 0.975. Good, good, good. Now, notice that it does not ask you for a mu and a sigma because, ladies and gentlemen, we ain't got no mu or sigma. What do we got? We need to know the degrees of freedom. In order to tell our calculator the degrees of freedom, we have to know the sample size that we're working with in the T distribution. So if I have a sample size of 12, what are my degrees of freedom? 11. So either one of these, you will get the same answer. One of them will be negative. One of them will be positive. However, we are always going to use the 
positive number because t star is a distance. It is how many standard deviations we are using. So, what'd you get when you plug this in? 2.2. 2. 2. 2. Or negative 2.2. And here we go with our T star critical value for 11 degrees of freedom with 95% confidence equals 2.2. All right, now, time out for a second. Somebody remind me what the Z star critical value for 95% is. Come on, kids, you got to know this one. 1.96. Because remember, it is about 2, right? 68, 95 about two. Notice that the T star, I had to go further to capture 95%. That's because there's more area in the tail. All right. Think about taking the Z distribution, 95%, and then squatting the Z distribution down because there's more area floating out in the tails because of the extra variability. I have to go a little further to capture that same 95% because my 95% got squatted down and went a little out, right? Right? So my T star for 95% with 11 degrees of freedom, I have to go a little further to capture that same 95%. Now, I want you guys to do me a favor. Go back to inverse T. Go back to inverse T. Second bar is inverse T. I want you to leave it as 95%, right? So just leave your area the same. Change your degrees of freedom to 50. So that's a sample size of 51. Change your degrees of freedom to 50. What do you got? 2.01. 2.01. Notice that when my degrees of freedom went up, my sample size went up, my variability shrinks, and so I don't have to go out as far. One more time, inverse T, <coughs> inverse T for me, and put a degree of freedom, put 100. What do you get? Notice that it's getting closer to my Z star. Once you have a sample size about, I don't know, 150-ish, your T star and your Z start to look so close together because you've taken a big enough sample size that you've decreased your variability to where it will be close enough to the Z star critical value. <coughs> yes, yes. Hence why we have a central limit theorem for means. Hallelujah. Yeah, the, the 30 thing. Yeah, yeah, the 30 thing. All right, cool. One more T star critical value, and then we're going to do a four-step process with T. Oh, yeah. Life is good. 90% here in the middle. That means uh, what's our area in one tail? 0. 0.05. All right. So we can use inverse T. Area is 0. 0.05. Oh, wow. Wait. What is our degrees of freedom? It says we have a random sample of 48. So what is our degrees of freedom? 47, very good. Now, I could have also used an area of 0.95. Either one would have worked exactly the same. One of them's negative, one of them's positive. Now, again, my sample size is a little bit bigger on this one. So, my T star critical value should be pretty close, sim sort of close-ish, to my Z star critical value for 90%. Do you guys remember the Z star critical value for 90%? 1.645. So what did you get for your T star critical value with 47 degrees freedom? 1.68. Wow. 1.645, 1.68. Wow, these are pretty close because my sample size was pretty big. Okay. So uh, that one was negative. This one was positive. So our T star critical value with 47 degrees of freedom for 90% confidence equals 1.68. So ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that at some point, your Z star critical value and your T star critical value are pretty close. The bad news is that there's really not a way to memorize these because they're always different. Yeah, so sad. 
But, oh, okay, let me, let me give you a, a positive, negative, positive sandwich. Here's the positive, the last positive here. Are you ready? The good news is that most of the time you're just plugging all this crap in your calculator and it's doing all the work anyway. So there you go. Speaking of, what do you think the conditions are for constructing a confidence interval from you? Random. We need an SRS of blah, 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 blah. Uh, by the way, why do we check this? This ensures X bar is an unbiased estimator of mu. Yay. Okay, so we're going to check random. That's not going away. What else should we check? Independent. Independent. We want to make sure that 10 times the sample size is less than the population. Most of the time we're going to assume this to be true. Why do we check this? This ensures our sample has good variability. Remember, this is, we, we check this because of the standard deviation part of the formula, the standard error part. It's that picture over on the sideboard over here. Remember, if we take too big of a sample, we might get little pockets of bias, too many people giving their opinion from Stonebridge Ranch, right? We don't want that. I'm just kidding. I love you, Stonebridge Ranch kids. All right, what's the last one? We got to make sure we have a normal distribution. Now, Time out. It is not the normal Z distribution, but we still got to make sure it's the normal T distribution, but we still check it the same way. Do you guys remember how we make sure that we have a normal distribution for means? All right, so one of these must be true. Either the population is approximately normal, or what's our backup plan in case we don't know the shape of our population? If n is greater than or equal to 30, the CLT applies. What does CLT stand for? Central Limit Theorem. Guess what, you guys? There's actually a third way. <laughs> I'm so excited. This is new. Breaking news, ladies and gentlemen. There is a third way. Oh, oh, oh boy, oh boy. <clears throat> Ready? The graph of sample data shows no outliers or strong skewness. So this is the graph of the sample data. So that means, guys, we're going to get to make dot plots or box plots. Aren't you excited? No. <laughs> here's, the, here's the reasoning behind this. If we don't know if the population is normal, but we have a sample that is fairly normal looking, then we can assume it came from a normal population. So it's kind of, we're kind of going out on a limb here, but if we have an approximately normal sample graph, we're probably good to go. Okay, so that's how that works. Cool? Doesn't that sound fun? All right. Guess what we still have? We still have a four-step process. State, we will estimate the true mean mu of blah, 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 blah. Plan, we're still going to do random 10%, the independent condition, normal. Again, there is this new thing now. The graph of the sample data is approximately normal. That's going to be okay for us if we have to go there. We prefer the first two, but any one of those three will meet the qualification. 
do. This is where we're going to go to our calculator, folks. This is where our calculator is going to do it all for us. And we're going to be say, thank you, calculator. We love you and have a great day. And then we conclude, we are C% confident that the interval from, blah, 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 blah. okay, great, yes, okay, cool, calculator. This one looks very different. So here's where we're going to go. We're going to go to stat, test, and it is option, <laughs> I believe it's option. It actually says T interval. It's number eight. It's number eight. It just says T interval. Stat test eight. It is a T interval. I want you guys to go ahead and go there and just hit enter. And then just look at the screen. It's scary. You have two options, first of all. You have the option of data or stats. So data, this is going to be use when individual values are provided. So basically, if the problem gives you the individual values, you're going to want to use data. So notice what it says there. The next thing it asks you for in that, on that screen, if, you're, if you've got data selected, it asks you for where's your list. Well, it should say L1. What does that mean you probably should have already done at that point? You probably should have put data into L1 first. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little hint. If the problem gives you the individual data, it's probably because your sample size was small and you've got to look at a graph of the data or make a graph of the data. So if you look at a problem and you have the individual data written there, chances are you're making a graph. Okay? Fun, right? Sure. All right. Then it says frequency. You can leave that as one. Then it asks you for your C level. Obviously, that's your confidence level as a decimal. And then it, uh, then it says calculate, right? All right, cool. So that's if you have the individual data. Now, if you don't have the individual data, then your problem has to provide for you the mean of the sample and the standard deviation of the sample. So if you guys will, please hit the right arrow and then hit enter on stats. Hit the right arrow and hit enter on stats. So this is use when a summary of data is provided. All right, now notice in this situation, your calculator wants to know, hey, what was X bar? That's your sample mean. That would have to be given to you in the problem if you don't have the individual data to find it yourself. It wants to know what is S sub X. That's your sample standard deviation. That has to be given to you in the problem. Otherwise, you need the data to find it yourself. Then it wants to know, hey, what's N? What's your sample size? Again, calculator has to know that. And then it wants your C level. And that is, again, your confidence level as a decimal. I believe those are all the questions that your calculator is asking you about. Okay. So which one of these do you use? Well, it depends on what you were given in the problem. And then you go forth and do. Cool? What questions, comments, or concerns do you have? I think that we just should jump in and do one. Let's go. Oh, yeah. I love it. Too much screen time. 
Reagan believes that students at McKinney Boyd High School spend way too much time on their phones and other devices. Just wait until, oh well, actually you've already got your screen time report on Sunday from last week when we had the snow days. How bad was that? Oh, you did? You're like, I don't want to know my screen time. Okay, got it. All right. So to investigate, she estimates the mean amount of screen time for all students by taking a random sample of 50 students. Guys, guys, good news. At that moment, you should have just jumped for joy. Why? Why did we jump for joy when we read that there's a random sample of 50? It's greater than 30. We ain't got to make no graph. All right. She finds that the average daily screen time for those in the sample is X bar is 7.1 hours a day. Sample standard deviation S sub X is 2.4 hours. Wow. We are going to construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the mean amount of daily screen time for all McKinney Boyd High School students. State! We will estimate the true mean mu screen time of MBHS students at a 90% confidence level. Again, we will estimate, because we're making an interval that gives an estimate for the truth, we will estimate the true mean, mu, screen time of McKinney Boyd High School students at a 90% confidence level. My, that's my introduction statement. Everybody now knows what we're about to do. Next, plan, random. Do we have a random sample? We have an SRS of 50 students. Yeah, independent. 10 times 50 is 500. Do you think that is less than the population of McKinney Boyd High School students? Probably. And yay, I already know the happy news for normal. Since n equals 50, which is greater than or equal to 30, the CLT applies. Let's freaking go. My sampling distribution of x bar is approximately normal. Cool? Everybody good? Everybody got this? All right, it's time to do the do. Let's do. We are going to use a one mean T interval. That's what this one's called. It is one sample. We took one sample of 50. We're doing a mean, we're estimating a mean of the population. We're using a T distribution because we don't know sigma, so we have to use T because there's extra variability, and we are creating a confidence interval, okay? Now, we're gonna go to our stat test eight, T interval. Stat test eight, T interval. X bar, what is it? Oh, oh, you need to go over to stats because we were given stats in this problem. X bar, what is it? 7.1. S sub X, what is it? 2.4. N, what is it? 50. C level, what is it? 0.9. Make sure you put it in as a decimal. Make sure you put it in as a decimal. <clears throat> now, your calculator is going to take a second. You're actually going to see your calculator think if you watch it. When you hit enter on calculate, you'll see some of you. Maybe 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 those really thin calculators don't have to think, but those other ones, they have to think for a second. 
And you'll actually see, like, on the right side of the screen, like, you'll see a little bar. That's, like, that's, that's your calculator's little wheel, right? Your little color wheel of death that you hate seeing. So that is your calculator thinking because it has to calculate the degrees of freedom, the T star critical value, the standard error, then get the margin of error, then do the plus or minus to the, to the point estimate. That's a lot. So... What is the interval? What'd you get? 6.531.2. All right. Let's conclude. We are. What are we? 90% confident that the interval... From 6.531 hours to 7.669 hours captures the true mean mu screen time for McKinney Boyd High School students. Don't laugh at me. Y'all know you've done that before. We are 90% confident that the interval from 6.531 hours to 7.669 hours captures the true mean mu screen time for McKinney Boyd High School students. Woo! You guys just did your second state plan do conclude. Oh, wow. Yeah! You just did your second inference procedure. Guys, this is number two of 13 that you're going to learn. Oh, this, this is kind of two and three. This is number two. Sorry. All right. We have a follow-up question. You guys, look. There's a follow-up question. A recent report stated that U.S. teens have 6.7 hours of daily screen time on average. Yes. Does our interval from part A, look, careful, careful, does our interval from part A provide convincing evidence that the mean at McKinney Boyd High School differs from the national average? No. Why not? No, the national average value is within our interval, our McKinney Boyd High School interval. We ain't no different than the rest of the world. We just average like the rest of them. Well, the nation, not the world. All right, the nation. Man, you guys rocked it today. Let's freaking go.